Just when we thought the outbreak couldn't get worse, they appeared. There's no point in running. They're everywhere. Back to relevant history and today we're gonna learn how to become plague doctors correction we're gonna learn how to become medieval plague doctors with the whole 2020 pandemic thing there's been a rise in plague doctor costumes you know the ones with the beak and with it there's also been a rise in the belief that these were the suits that medieval plague doctors wore during you know the black death however i have to break it to you the truth is that these suits were pretty much created in the 1600s and the black death happened in the 14th century Despite that, this gives me a chance to tell you about the actual medieval plague doctors and their practices during the Black Death. How did they react to the Black Death? Because that honestly can give us a little bit of a comparison between what happened in the 14th century and to what's happening now. And apart from that, I'm still going to be using the plague doctor suit to talk about it. Because you could kind of consider it as the peak evolution of the theories that medieval doctors used because pretty much after that, they were pretty much thrown out the window and actually replaced by actual science. <laughs> Let's review the Plague Doctor costume from the bottom up, starting with the shoes, which are supposed to be thick leather boots, but honestly, I don't have any, so these will have to do. You know what shoes remind me of? Traveling. So let's go over how plague and COVID spread and traveled. When it comes to the origins of the Black Death, historians don't know exactly where and when it started. The most we can narrow it down is that it started somewhere in Central Asia, perhaps within the borders of the Chinese Empire, but once again, we're not 100% sure. By 1330, there's already records describing the illness, so that's the closest we can get. Now with COVID, it's different. We know that for sure the first cases began in Wuhan, China on December 2019, and by 2020, we knew that we were dealing with a new virus. That's actually also another difference. The Black Death was not caused by a virus, but by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis. This bacteria infected fleas, and these fleas obviously lived on black rats. And since these black rats traveled along with humans through the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean route, that's how they easily spread it to humans. It's very likely that COVID also came from an animal, and once it was transferred to humans, it pretty much spread like almost all the other coronaviruses, which is through sneezing, coughing, air droplets, or touching infected surfaces. The virus also spread very easily because of traveling, specifically because in the December-January period, you know, there's things like Christmas, uh, vacation, Chinese New Year, so there was a lot of tourism, especially through obviously like airline traveling. While the spread of the virus was very well documented through, you know, like people's own social media or news outlets or health organizations, for the Black Death, the best record that we have of how it spread from east to west and when it arrived into Europe is by a man called Giovanni Vocaccio who was in Florence which was one of the first cities to be hit by the plague when it hit mainland Europe. The plague entered Europe via Messina in 1347 and from there it moved through ships into Florence in 1348. Let's move on to the next part of the costume which would be this garb that post medieval plague doctors would wear and it was made of leather and was completely covered in wax. Now in reality medieval plague doctors they actually didn't wear any of this they really didn't really wear anything to kind of protect themselves from catching the <laughs> the plague and experiencing the horrible symptoms at most what they would do is they would actually put perfume on their clothes i'll explain why later when it comes to describing the symptoms of the plague three of the best sources that we can look at are once again giovanni vocaccio in his account of florence we also have angelo di tura who wrote about the plague in the city of Siena in Italy, and John de Venet, who was living in France. They would describe that patients would get things like initially like fevers, uh, vomiting, nausea, and from there, there was these kind of boils that form in the armpits and the groin of the person. And eventually these would either burst or turn black, and it would follow by a really painful death within three or five days. These are the symptoms of the most common form of plague, which was the bubonic plague. Bubonic because the buboes, or the big 
swollen areas were actually swollen lymph nodes which were being attacked by the bacteria. Now there was also other descriptions of the plague which at first might seem exaggerated such as Vokasho saying how some people would just be walking the streets and all of a sudden fall dead or how animals touched the clothing of someone who had died and a few minutes later they would be dying. Now this might be some exaggeration caused because of the fear of catching the plague but that's not completely true because you see there's another form of plague called septicemic plague which was known to be the deadliest, the fastest but luckily the rarest form of plague. It was caused when after like getting the flea bites or being infected it didn't attack the lymph nodes but instead it went right through the bloodstream it bypassed the lymph nodes and then it started attacking you know like your organs throughout the bloodstream or your blood cells themselves. That was the reason why septicemic plague killed so quickly and so effectively. That thing pretty much had almost an 100% death rate. Now no medieval source really found that there was a difference between septicemic and bubonic plague but some doctors outside of the three sources that I mentioned were actually able to find a rather interesting difference that sometimes some people would like start coughing up blood or you know get sick from coughing and then eventually die between one and two days. And this is actually very interesting because that means that they were very close to finding out that there was a third manifestation of the plague which was called pneumonic plague. Pneumonic plague because instead of attacking lymph nodes or the bloodstream it actually attacked the lungs. This is pretty bad too like it would cause things like pneumonia and quickly lead to death. I would consider this for example like the mid tier of the plague. It wasn't the it was right between septicemic and bubonic plague as a term of the worst. And honestly from here I would say that pneumonic plague is the closest we can have to what would be the plague version of, of COVID. It was spread through air droplets as well, through like coughing or touching surfaces where someone had coughed. Really there isn't that many similarities apart from the initial symptoms, things like you know getting some coughing, uh, some fever, fatigue, vomiting. Shortness of breath, maybe. But apart from that, the disease, the manifestation of each disease was not really that similar. But let's put this aside because now we get into the interesting things. Plague doctors, both medieval and post medieval, did carry with them bags where they had all their treatments. But obviously, when we're talking about like the first wave of the Black Death, no government, no religious institution, and certainly no doctor had any idea of what to do when people got infected. You can summarize this fear of the unknown that was happening in 1347 just by looking at what Jean de Venet wrote where he literally said and I quote so many people died that all believe it was the end of the world. That doesn't mean that there was also no public fear when the virus started spreading in 2020. I mean for example just look at all the videos of the stores and how they were all emptied out. But there is very big differences in how we were able to deal with it compared to the people back in the middle ages. First of all our society has a better understanding of epidemiology. So we were able to understand the virus faster than anyone in the Middle Ages was able to understand the plague. And a lot of this actually also was due to the past experience that we've had with other respiratory illnesses. And luckily illnesses that were also coronaviruses and they also pretty much cause very similar symptoms. For that reason there's way better research when it comes to for example antibiotics in the case of the plague if it were to break out today or again like COVID-19 vaccines development to prevent them. 2020 has also been very lucky in that we know how to treat people that get complications such as like breathing problems because of COVID which is obviously put them on a ventilator to save their lives. That is completely different with the middle ages where once people got the plague the most doctors can do is like work on their faulty theories and try to see if they can get something that could at least relieve the pain or maybe, although obviously it never happened, cure them. A lot of this happened through practices like bloodletting, which usually just weakened the patient and pretty much put them in a worse condition. Sometimes they would purposely burst the buboes, which could only lead to infection and pretty much just end the person there. Sometimes they tried obviously some sort of skin oil, whatever they could mix up, which obviously didn't really either even help or even harm the patient. And yes, sometimes doctors got so desperate and didn't know what to do at all and then they went with the frogs and the leeches. My personal favorite treatment that was used by medieval doctors was this thing called theriac. It was this basically concoction or mix of a bunch of different herbs and spices uh, in the hopes that maybe this would kind of like help 
the patients. Now that doesn't mean that obviously fake or alternative treatments to COVID have been arising. There's definitely a lot. Just look at these. Radionics machine, Schwing Schwingling Ganglion, injecting house cleaner, hand cream, garlic, bananas, alcohol, water, ginger, lemon, mangoes, durian, onions. It's everything. Everything and anything is apparently a cure. But obviously, as you could tell, there's a very big difference here, which is that those alternative treatments were created by people. They were not created by doctors. While in the Middle Ages, these alternative treatments were being created by doctors themselves because they literally did not know what to do with the plague. And you know what? It's so easy to make a fake treatment. Like, I can literally do that right now. gentlemen it's what I call a mistake I would never drink this unless I was super super desperate that that can go over there I'm telling you if theriac back in 1347 did not work it'll definitely not work in 2020 let's get back to the actual information and move on to the gloves and the stick of a plague doctor now medieval plague doctors actually did use sticks they use them to uh, keep people far away when they were inspecting them and they were visiting them because obviously they didn't want to get too close to like catch the plague and this brings me to the idea of prevention the first big changes that came with the plague in terms of uh, medical prevention and the way uh, doctors and health officials work was that for the first time they had to start doing health policy on a massive scale at this point the only thing they could pretty much do was start creating mass graves and count how many people had died now also for the first time because there was very little uh, ability for the government overall to enforce or enact the policies to help slow down the spread of the plague they had to uh, create for the first time what we would call health boards these agencies were actually given way too much power and most of the time enacted extreme policies a lot of the times this was because they didn't really have time to uh, analyze all the policies and see which one could actually work they were really desperate at, at this point and so they just enacted anything that they thought that might or might might help might not most of these for example were you know cleaning streets ordering people to clean streets uh funding giving extra funding for churches or dedicating churches to a, a specific saint uh, allowing certain processions to go on in the streets in the hopes you know that religious intervention will help ease the uh, pandemic oh there was also a blockades that were done uh, especially during the port cities such as those of Florence and Venice they would blockade and not allow uh, ships trading ships to enter now definitely some of the more worst policies were those that targeted specific groups uh, because they a lot of people had the belief that certain groups were the ones that were causing the pestilence for example these would mostly be people like prostitutes uh, leopards beggars and unfortunately also Jews another policy that was enacted that was somewhat useful was sanitary condoms which were like these guard posts of soldiers that were put in the roads leading up to cities and they would be ordered to not let persons come in. Now as time went on, certain policies were discontinued and others stayed because obviously some of them uh, were starting to have some effect in slowing down the plague a little. These would be for example the sanitary condoms that I was talking about. Uh, cleaning streets also because obviously if you have your streets clean uh, there is less likely to be rats going around. There was also an increase in the hiring of doctors during this time. So definitely the profession as a doctor started to uh, increase in value. They were being paid more and there was obviously a more increase or demand for people to become doctors. Now in port cities such as those in Florence and Venice, uh, the idea of having a blockade throughout the, the port when ships were coming in was definitely improved as uh, later waves of the plague came. For example, like one of the best uh, developments that they had was the creation of the Lazaretto, which was supposed to be this island that was designated for uh, having people who were coming in or people who were already sick in the city to be taken there. And that's where they would be for uh, either treatment or for quarantine, which actually here's a relevant fact for you. Actually, the word quarantine comes from the Italian quaranta giorni, uh, which means 40 days, the period that all ships were required to be isolated before crew could go ashore during the Black Death. Also, there was the creation of pest houses, which I guess you could call them as kind of like hospitals. There were places designated so that people once 
doctors already identified that there was someone who was down with the plague, they would take them there and that's where they would try to, you know, like give them treatment or at least keep them there. And although most of the time people obviously still ended up dying, that was actually very useful because rather than having a doctor go from one house to the other to see if uh, the person is sick to give them treatment, all the sick people were put in a, a place. As you can see, it took a while for uh, governments back in 1347 uh, up to like 1351, 1353 when the plague ended. It took them a while to develop effective health policies to combat the spread of the plague. And I mean, this this is completely different compared to like what we see now. Like, if you think that the policies that are being enacted now to prevent the virus, such as, you know, social distancing, wearing masks. Oh, that is nothing compared to what happened in the Middle Ages. For example, one village in Spain was forced by law to kill all the, their animals, their pets, their cats, their dogs. Today we're gonna put a dog down. One of the reasons why we are not experiencing overreaching draconian government is because we have way more institutionalized and better set up uh, systems to help cope with the crisis. Think of uh, national health agencies or the World Health Organization. They are already in place and once the pandemic started, they right away got to work into trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, what are the best policies to undertake in order to slow down the virus while maintaining obviously like the social, economic and political uh, structure as stable as possible. And now this doesn't mean that obviously governments were uh, immune to almost uh, bending or to the point of almost breaking down. We saw a lot of countries at the very beginning definitely go be in a really really bad shape. But despite that one thing that this has shown us is that our economic structures uh, were more prepared and more uh, resistant to this sort of crisis that we're experiencing compared to the medieval structures in the 14th century. Okay, now let's talk about the actual like mask of the plague doctors. The reason why uh, these post medieval doctors had these weird masks was because of a theory called the miasma theory. So the idea was basically that disease was spread or it came from something from something bad that was in the air. For example, these masks obviously had like a little kind of like a filter right here full of herbs and spices that once like a doctor would breathe through, uh, it would supposedly clean the air. So obviously this is completely wrong and unfortunately like there was no more advancements on medical science during the medieval ages beyond that. So that's why you had, so, for example, like recommendations such as like avoiding contact with others, which would in a way, it would kind of work obviously because it wasn't really the air that was infected it was like the fleas there was also for example um avoiding swamps because they supposedly had bad air in them closing your windows so that like cold drafts wouldn't come inside and that's why like that's supposedly what would make you sick from there that's where you get uh the idea of um putting perfumes or um you know having herbs uh medieval plague doctors didn't wear the mask but what they did was actually uh, carry with them incense. They would burn incense while they were walking so as to kind of purify the air. Or, you know, they would um, recommend people to, whenever they would go outside, to carry plants with them. Or, you know, sprinkle herbs around so that um, the bad air wouldn't get to them and it would make them um, catch the plague. Sometimes they really just started creating their own ideas, thinking that maybe this would help. And then if it didn't work, maybe this other thing would help. But it was all based on the smell. And one of the other ones was literally to tell people that cut an apple, put herbs and spices on it, and just smell it whenever you would go outside. Yes, medieval doctors literally told people that an apple, they would keep the doctor away. No joke. Here's another relevant fact for you. Apparently, new types of cologne and perfume were invented and popularized during the Middle Ages because of this, because they believed that when they would put it on, they would protect them from uh, catching the plague. Now, obviously for us, we are way better off in terms of medical knowledge again. And I have to stress that enough. We know what we're doing. We're not in complete darkness for this. Think about it. It took us, well, like two, three months to understand the basics of uh, how to prevent people from catching the virus. How, do you, how much do you think it took um, people to know that the Black Death was spread by fleas? Let's see, uh, one, two, three, try five centuries. I don't know about you, but that's a tad too late for the poor medieval people. Now it's time to look at the very last part of the costume of a plague doctor, which is the hat. In reality, medieval plague doctors didn't wear a hat like this because prior to the Black Death, or even during the Middle Ages at all, doctors were a very rare sight. 
they weren't like today where you have you know like a family doctor or a doctor that you go to see you once a year or something like that in fact the terms physician and surgeon were actually not known in medieval Europe until like the 10th century so that gives you an idea of how uncommon or how little spoken of were doctors back then I mean they didn't really have a social value if you want to call it that or a reputation within society so obviously that changed once the black death hit because what cities did in order to take care of all the sick was hire people to become doctors or hire actual doctors because obviously there was a shortage of uh, doctors which meant sometimes unfortunately the people that were hired as community doctors you know or like city doctors uh, were actually not really well prepared to become actual doctors so unfortunately what this meant was that doctors didn't really have a reputation beforehand and for the first time that they were being exposed to like the majority of people they weren't really able to do that much of a good job and that unfortunately caused a lot of mistrust within doctors and health officials in general once uh, health boards were set up now that doesn't mean that there was some uh, doctors that were locally uh, applauded for their brave actions especially in places where the doctors that were hired almost all of them died and maybe a few remained uh, they were very well like appreciated by the people for their bravery of trying to find out what was going on with this huge amount of people dying yet again just like in medieval times doctors now and then have definitely been at a high risk of uh, contracting the illnesses that they were fighting and obviously also dying from them another big contribution that doctors uh, had during this time and that helped kind of shape their profession was really like uh, you what you want to call it like the research what they did was they wrote these kind of treatises where they kind of reported again things like the symptoms how many people had died how long it took for the symptoms to start developing although these things didn't end up really giving too much information for people to use during the time of the pandemic it actually helped historians later on identify uh, the what the black death was was indeed bubonic plague and pneumonic plague and septicemic plague over time as uh, health boards became more organized and the profession of a doctor was more organized as well a lot of other jobs were given to doctors to help deal with the pandemic of the black death doctors were no longer going from house to house to look at patients instead as what they would do is they would go into houses to identify them and then from there they would uh, report it and then they could either have them to stay at home which was very rare in most cases instead they would send them to lazaretos or pest houses i would say the most meaningful thing that doctors found during the black death through the treatises was the difference between you know regular bubonic plague and uh, pneumonic plague another really interesting thing is that as the as the pandemic went on you would see uh, some doctors starting to consult uh, Muslim doctor treatises or records. That's actually really important because you can tell that doctors once the miasma theory kept failing to them and failing and failing, they kind of started to look at other directions or other uh, fields outside of the miasma theory for uh, medical advice. Even though some Muslims still use like the miasma theory, they were trying to see if they could find something else that could help them. And although the Muslims uh, also didn't really have much to help it kind of t shows that doctors were trying to expand their borders because they knew that this was not working there was a few rare treatises that showed an eventual and very slow and i mean very slow as in like two three centuries understanding of uh, the plague as it continued to come and it even come for example there were two physicians later on in the 16th century it was giralomo fracastoro and in the 17th century it was athanasius kirkshir who began to develop this idea that the plague was not being spread because the air became corrupted and the air was like the thing that was causing uh, the illness but rather it was some sort of substance or something within you know whether it be the air or maybe with people within people that was causing it to spread to other people and infecting them and that was actually a very important uh, discovery that at that time or theory that at that time was not being accepted but would definitely start making the building blocks for what would become the germ theory well that is the end of the information part of this video and i would like to remind you for those who are still here of three things first of all is that obviously plague doctors with a big mask although they were not from the middle ages they definitely reflect a lot of what the 
wacky and weird practices that doctors used to have back then when the plague struck. The second thing is obviously that there are definitely some similarities uh, with what's been happening now in 2020 with uh, what happened in 1347 through 1351-53. But there's definitely a lot of big differences that put us in a bigger advantage than what the poor people in the Middle Ages had to deal with. Well, that's it for today's video. It's definitely important to look back at history and see how humans have dealt with similar epidemics in the past. It uh, helps us calm down, know that we can definitely get through it and that we already have knowledge in the past to help us. But that being said, thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned and you also enjoyed it. What the? What the? The plague might have ended and so will COVID, but we will always be here waiting for the next pandemic. But don't worry, we have been learning and I promise next time we will be good doctors. Hey, what's up guys? It's Darius here. Do not be afraid, I am the cure.